Hi, and welcome back to Grassroots Crypto, where I like to teach people about crypto. In this video, we're going to be continuing our four view series, looking at how 4chain works. In the last video, we covered 4chain vaults and the incentive pendulum in this video here. If you haven't checked that one out, um, do go check it out because this video will be a continuation on from these two videos here. So explain that there are different types of vaults. Uh, there's the Asgard Vault, the primary vault, and then there's the Yggdrasil Vault, uh, which is kind of like the secondary vault. You can think of it as a cold vault here, hot vault there. Um, and the node that we walked through in a, in a previous video has the primary key for this particular vault. We also talked about the incentive pendulum and how that can change the, the flow of system income to the liquidity providers and the nodes. And essentially it provides incentives to move liquidity from either the nodes to the liquidity pools or vice versa. I like to keep it simple here at Grassroots Crypto, but this video we need to get technical to really understand how 4chain does security. What secures the network? Why are the funds safe? What mechanisms are in place to ensure that no one can steal funds specifically from the Asgard vault? And what, what processes are, are done to ensure that uh, the network is not um, stagnated and, and resistant to capture? We'll be talking about TSS in detail and the churn process. Since to understand the churn process, you really need to understand TSS and TSS and how TSS relates to the Asgard vault. There's a lot of technical stuff in here, so I'll try and keep it as simple as possible. And there's a lot to get through, so let's just strap in and get started. Just a bit on keys first, um, and I've got a nice little picture. You have a primary key that needs to be obviously kept private, only visible to you. And that's usually your 12 or 24 words, or what they call seed phrase. And then that is used to create a public key through some, some maths. A public key is then hashed through a special um, hash function that is used to create a wallet. And um, to spend crypto, um, you, know, you send money from a wallet, you need to have the private key to sign a transaction in order to, for you know, that, that, those funds to be sent from that particular address. The private key essentially here gives you spending authority on that wallet. So now we understand this, let's talk about vault security. As discussed previously, nodes have the private key to the Yggdrasil vault, so they essentially have spending authority on that. But the Yggdrasil vault is economically secured via the node's bond. If nodes do not do what is expected, they will be slashed, e.g. they'll start losing some of their rewards or even the bond that they put in. If they steal funds, they will be slashed more than the funds they stole. Recently, a node did not hand back their Yggdrasil vault properly and they were slashed $250,000 worth of rune. Um, and that was taken to replace the vault that they did not hand back correctly. Node operators are second class citizens within Thorchain. They are paid a lot to maintain and secure the network, which includes their own Yggdrasil vault. And they're paid to do this for the first class citizens, which are liquidity providers. Put simply, node operators need to do the right thing and secure themselves and their Yggdrasil vault, else Thorchain will economically penalize them and even replace them with someone or a node operator that is willing to do the right thing. Withdrawals from Thorchain can also happen from the Yggdrasil vault, however that still does require two-thirds majority agreement and that is managed by Thorchain's BFT blockchain, which I'll touch on a little bit later. BFT is Benzentine Fault Tolerant. So that's what secures the Yggdrasil vault here, or the secondary vaults that each node operator has. Um, what secures the Asgard vault? And who holds the primary key for the Asgard vault where the majority of the funds are stored? That's a great question. So introducing a wonderful new technology called TSS or uh, Threshold Signature Scheme. TSS is based, or Fullchain's TSS reference here, and then uh, Fullchain has a white paper um, here as well, is based on the white paper here, Fast Multi-Party Threshold ECDSA with Fast Trustless Setup, which is a 2018 paper. This is complex stuff because Fast Multi-Party Threshold ECDSA with Fast Setup technology that Thorchain um, uses, Thorchain expands on and adds to 
that it that is then used in different components and processes within thought chain so it's really kind of complex because it's embedded in all these different parts so first we're going to talk about this technology um, and then we can whilst we're doing that see how that relates to thought chain and we can also talk about how thought chain has added to it Note this paper was done in 2018 and there's also been um, some updates on the GG20 that's also been implemented uh, implemented into uh, ThoughtChain. But this should give you a really good um, concept of the two primary processes that are used uh, within TSS. I've got all the links uh, below. So if you want to learn more, there's um, Binance got a nice uh, overview of TSS. We can, um, I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, I've got the, this is an actual um, overview from the, one of the authors here. You can read this and this gets, you know, fairly technical with the maths. Uh, here's another YouTube video you can have a look at as well that goes through some of the maths uh, for this particular technology. If you're new to this and you're like, oh, this is, this is kind of tough. Um, I quite like this guy, um, computer file, and he goes through in this particular video, Diffie-Hellman, which is um, a key, Diffie-Hellman key exchanging without revealing the, the private key. And he does it like really cool with these glasses and colored dyes and stuff like that. So you can understand the mixing. I find that um, this is quite good to understand. Uh, and you can also read the, um, this is the Thorchain white paper as well as Thorchain's um, uh, TSS white paper as well, um, as well as obviously the actual underlying original GG18 paper. So all the links will be um, in the description below and you can have a look at them um, in your own time. Before we get into uh, um, talking about this, let's just understand what ECDSA is. ECDSA stands for Elliptical Curve Digital Signature Algorithm. It's used in crypto, like you know, like Bitcoin and stuff like that. And it's how a private key is used to sign a message or transaction when you spend your crypto. So feel free to research this more, as well as um, asymmetrical cryptography. Yes, that's a really cool um, thing to understand. But all you need to know now is a private key is generally needed to sign a transaction, um, and ECDSA is an algorithm that allows you to do that. Um, if we go back to here, so that's that. So you'd be, if this is Bitcoin, you'd be using ECDSA to, to, with your private key to sign a transaction and to enable you to uh, spend um, or send uh, funds or assets from this particular wallet. Right, so now we've got that out of the way. Um, when we go back to here, so fast multi-party threshold ECDSA with fast trustless setup has two main parts. There's the key generation process, and this allows nodes to sign transactions with, uh, within a key signing process um, by creating a very special kind of key. Uh, all nodes must participate in the process because any node may be required to sign a process. So, so that's the key generation process. Then we have the key signing process. So given N amount of node operators or all parties, a threshold of T nodes are required to sign a transaction. In ThorChain, the threshold is 67%, thus two thirds of the nodes are needed to sign a transaction for the key signing process to be completed. There are 36 nodes currently in single chain chaos net, so 24 of the nodes are required to be in the key signing process. But kind of what I said before, all 36 will have need to be in the key generation process. So let's talk about each step in, uh, in more detail. So let's first talk about the key generation process. This allows a public key to be created without a private key. Then the public key is used to create a wallet address or a bunch of addresses. This is how the Asgard vault is actually created, which is currently a BNB address. Um, there's also a four uh, address and then more will be created um, within multi-chain chaos net for Bitcoin, Ethereum, and so on and so forth. So let's have a, a quick look at uh, that one. So this is the current um, Asgard vault address, and this would be the public key that's been created here. The public key is created by all nodes working together to perform complex maths to create this shared public key. This involves all nodes sending secret shares and performing complex maths on each one to create this public key. Nodes have to have good communication with each other, clocks are synced, 
and nodes need to have an awareness on who all the other nodes are in the key generation process. Two keys are actually created on each node, a private key held by the node that is used for future signing of transactions and a public key that is sent around to all nodes so they can verify each other's signature later. These keys are specific to the node, not to the vault. Um, collectively, nodes use this complex math uh, creation to create that public key here. The um, four chain uh, white paper puts it like this. Once a TSS key pair is generated, the local party stores the share of the TSS secret key locally and the public key is known and agreed by all the parties. If any parties do not cooperate in the key generation, others blame them. Since the local party only has the cryptographic share of the TSS secret key, no party can recover the secret key that matches the public key that generated among all the participants. As a result, no parties can sign the transactions on behalf of the rest of the participants. Right, so really the, the key things are obviously that, that um, TSS creates a, a key pair. So there's two, there's a private and a public one that's used for the nodes to, to verify each other. And that the, the local keys that the nodes uh, have are irreplaceable and can't be reverse engineered and a node cannot in, imitate another node because each part of the um, secret share is unique and specific to each node. All node operators must be active to do this and all must do it properly else the process fails. Adverse actors can try and attack and disrupt this um, key generation process to reveal secrets of the good nodes that are sent around, um, thus compromising security during the key generation process. And this is why it must be done completely by and properly by uh, all node operators. If adverse actors are detected during the process or for whatever reason it is abandoned, the entire process must be restarted. This must happen to ensure strong security. You can read more about this in the ThorChain uh, white paper. ThorChain will slash node operators who cause a key gen uh, process to fail and there it is here one hour of um, revenue the paper puts it like this if any of the signers are bought a key generation or key signing process which we'll talk about next which results in any attributable failure all participants can make a blame transaction if consensus is reached on who to blame e.g what node to blame the blame node is penalized and cycled to be churned out. If any parties do not, do not cooperate in the key generation process, others blame them, which will slash ruin from the node operator's bond. The key generation, if the key generation fails, um, 4chain will wait one hour before it restarts the um, key generation process again. The blame process is something that's a part of ThorChain's TSS process um, and not a part of um, this particular process here. Um, ThorChain's added that uh, subsequently. There's a bit more of the key generation process which you can read about in detail in ThorChain's uh, TSS white paper as well as this paper here. Um, and, and you know, it goes to quite amount of detail looking at all the maths and stuff like that um, involved. So knock your knock your socks off uh, going through this. In ThorChain, when a key generation process is completed, it would have been done with a specific set of nodes and a new Asgard vault would have been created. And this is the first step in the churn process, which we'll cover a little bit later. So let's move on to the key signing process. This process here. From the white paper, from this specific paper, it says the process is the distributed signing protocol, which takes a public input message M to be signed as well as a private input from each node. The ThorChain uh, white paper says this process allows a number of participants in nodes to sign on the message that can be verified by um, the ThorChain process or the, the public keys created within the, um, in the key generation process. So how does this work? Let's try and put this in context. When funds are to be moved from the Asgard vaults, that's like a withdrawal, um, due to a, you know, a person withdrawing funds or a Yugodasol top-up, which we talked about in the previous video, ThorChain currently selects at random 
two thirds of the nodes or 24 nodes to be in a signing party. The nodes do not have a choice in this. Each node must sign a transaction using their part of the key they created in the key generation process, which can be verified by all the other nodes. This means only nodes that were in the key gen process can be in this key signing process. Since the key gen requires membership, other nodes of the parties can, other nodes or parties cannot try and sneak into the key signing process. If all nodes do this with an acceptable time, it's usually about 10 to 15 seconds TSS takes, then ThorChain will allow funds to be removed from the Asgard vault. If it's not done with an acceptable time or there's a timeout and stuff like that, um, the blame transaction will be, uh, or the blame process will be initiated and uh, nodes that did not participate when they were selected will be slashed. So here's an example here. So nodes did not um, participate when uh, an outbound transaction is requested by the network, they'll be um, slashed and also have non-observation of uh, transactions as well. I think that pertains to um, seeing like signing by FOST uh, transactions, which we'll talk about in a second. Getting back to more of the TSS, also note the message that each party signs need to be the same. So ThorChain is a consensus of observation and the nodes need to have seen the same thing, um, you create and sign the same message uh, to reach a two thirds majority for the um, signing process to be completed. So they can't have different messages and say they saw different things. They all want to have an agreement that they all observe the same transactions and that's how consensus is, uh, is reached. Uh, TSS also does batch migrations. This is good to move um, like a batch of UTXOs for Bitcoin instead of doing individual transactions. It's much more efficient on the blockchain and exchanges do this all the time. So as a side note, single chain chaos net pre-selects them or selects the nodes at random. This may change to a first in best dress within multi-chain chaos net. Both processes have pros and cons, which we'll talk about now. Selecting the nodes. So nodes are randomly selected, so collusion becomes extremely difficult because nodes don't know whether they're gonna get selected or not. Um, however, if a node is non-responsive for some reason, or they're like asleep at the wheel, um, it's bad as the signing will fail until the random node is not selected. So I think, because we had this um, like this month, it's like one in five signing processes will fail if there's a node that's not responsive. While that node operator will be slashed and eventually removed as an active node, um, it can, and as I said, or it has, have a negative impact on the network. So looking at first in best dress, um, signing nodes may not be distributed as much as they, they would be if they were selected and may favor more nodes than the others, particularly ones that tune themselves to be quicker than other nodes. But it will ensure that nodes are responsive and able to sign. Um, also, I guess, remember that nodes are anonymous and don't know each other. So collusion is going to be very difficult at the best of times. How this all plays out, we'll, we'll see in multi-chain chaos now. So back to how the Asgard vault is protected. The two processes described means no node ever has the key to the Asgard vault. The main points to remember here are the private key to the vault never exists. TSS does not use any trusted dealer like other schemes do and does not store the private key in any specific, any specific place. Each node stores an individual piece that is unique to that node. And it's a leaderless protocol where the private key to control the vault, as I said, doesn't exist. So it can never be captured or stolen to gain control over the Asgard vault. Only nodes that when the key generation process can be in the key signing process, and they must be the same message, the same transaction, e.g. they must observe the same thing when they're in the key signing process to get that consensus. So there is the required cooperation of the nodes to generate the, the public key, the required cooperation of the nodes to sign the same transactions that move funds from the Asgard vault. This is what protects the Asgard vault. The maths used in the two process makes the TSS process unforgeable. You can check out all the proofs within the white paper because they go through them in quite uh, some detail. The above two processes with the blame transaction all part of ThorChain's uh, threshold signature scheme. So check out the TSS white paper for more details. Um, just a couple more side notes. So this paper, um, well, fast, What's it called? A fast multi-party threshold ECDSA with fast trustless setup and TSS. 
um, is quite new. And the reason why there is a currently a 36 node cap within ThorChain. So it's gonna be interesting to see what comes out, what technology, how this evolves. Um, but multi-chain ChaosNet will address the node cap via Asgard vault sharding, which we'll be talking more about in another video. Also note that ThorChain's implementation has been battle tested in single chain ChaosNet for about six months now with no major security issues. TSS currently secures all the funds within the Asgard vault in single chain chaos net, which is what's currently running now. So it is, whilst it's very new, um, it has been battle tested and it's currently what's uh, running in, in, you know, for when you use BEP swap and stuff like that now. So I wanted to talk about how to think about TSS or threshold signature scheme. And I always draw it sort of like, I guess as, as you learn more, you think about it differently. So you think about like TSS protects the Asgard vault in this respect. So, you know, the, the, the nodes have to come together to perform the TSS process, the signing process, and this is what protects the Asgard vault. And you see them as sort of like conceptually two different things. Um, but then, you know, as we've gone through with the key generation process, the key generation process actually creates the vault. So in a way, TSS, you can think of it, it is a TSS vault or TSS is the vault. So Asgard, TSS, like it's the same thing because the key generation creates the vault itself. Going further to that point, then like the nodes protect the Asgard vault. But if you think about it further, TSS is the vault and the nodes need to adhere to the TSS process else they will be penalized and replaced. So nodes don't actually secure the Asgard vault, TSS does. TSS kind of like secures itself and the nodes need to adhere to this process. So that's probably the best way to think about it. Um, and having now understand the key generation, the key signing process that the nodes must adhere to. All right, so that concludes part one. Whilst you're on the editing, um, I just wanted to cut it up into shorter videos, else it'll be too long. So, um, yeah, I hope you enjoyed that. If you like the video, like and subscribe and then get ready to watch part two. Thanks. Bye.